This is a relay box out of a Kawasaki bike and it was sent to me to take a look at by a chap called Adrian. He'd had to replace it at great expense and was wondering how serviceable it would have been. At the same time, uh, he said that the voltage regulation of the bike had failed and wondered if it had an effect. Now, I know you're not all into bikes, but you know what? Uh, I'm making this video because uh, ultimately it's quite interesting to see how to diagnose things and see if it is serviceable. It's always quite an interesting thing. So it comes with this, uh, Adrian sent this uh, set of sheets which give basic information. It says the relay box A has relays and diodes. It's very simple, it is just literally relays and diodes. And it said the relays and diodes cannot be removed. Oh, I think that's a challenge because it doesn't feel heavy enough to be potted. Now, it comes with a schematic of the relay box itself, which is very simple. It really is literally just relays. And the diodes, there, there's no active circuitry in there other than the diodes to root the current about a bit. And it also comes with a series of tests aimed for, for the bike mechanics to do checks on these units to see if they can do a basic diagnosis on it. Uh, but it's, it's not completely infallible. And the meter readings, they say, will be either infinity or not infinity because different meters will give different set of readings. They can't give a precise ohm value. And then it gives, uh, with the battery, either disconnect or connected, and also a voltage test. And the schematic, I want to say, when you see something, if you go to fix something and you see a schematic, it looks just like a rat's nest of wires here. Don't panic. Uh, the, all you have to know is that you don't have to take it all in at once. If you've got a problem with one specific thing, all you have to do is trace those wires back for that individual thing. And just you can check them for shorts. You can check them for if voltages are there or not there, and uh, continuity and things like that. You don't have to worry about the whole drawing. Just uh, concentrate on the wires that are of interest. So, since a bit of interest is the relay box here, I've printed this out. So I'm just going to lock the exposure off so it doesn't yo yo up and down. Now I've got rid of that bright white paper. So here's a enlarged uh, copy of this. And I'm just going to make sure this is focused as well. It's focused. Um, and I'm going to bring the meter in and we'll do some basic tests from outside because very this is quite helpful, this drawing, because it not just it doesn't just show you the relays with the coils inside and the contacts and the diodes, but it shows you uh, the pin layout in here, which makes it very easy. Uh, instead of having to, you know, try and pull shine torches in and see if there's any numbers printed inside. So let's do some basic tests on the relays. And what I'm going to do here... This relay here is connected between 18 and 19, so I've got this in continuity, which will it won't give a, a very, you know, what actually happens in the continuity test is the meter puts a, a low voltage across the leads, usually about 2 to 3 volts, and it displays the voltage across it. So if you put it across a diode with a forward voltage of approximately 0.6 volts, that basically means when the diode's turned on, it's got roughly 0.6 volts across it, then the meter will display roughly 0.6. So you can actually use it to do fairly sophisticated diagnosis or just as continuity across contacts. So let's start by sticking it across pins 18 and 19 to see if this coil here is intact. So 18 and 19 are the two end pins here. And I'm getting a reading, so that coil is present. Uh, let's check 16 goes through this diode, so it's going to have 0.6 already, plus the uh, voltage that's going to be um, formed across this coil, and to 12. So this time, because it's going through this diode, I'm going to have to put the positive to the 16 to go through this diode. So positive to terminal 16, which is way over here. So that's terminal 16, and I'm going to go from 16 through the diode, through the winding, to 12. So let's uh, go 16 to 12. Yep, that's there. So both these coils seem to be okay. Uh, 10 to 9, which is, um, there's 9, there's 10. No diode this time. It's there. Uh, 5 to 4, which is um, these two. Again, no diode. Oop. And it's there. And finally... This coil here, which uh, is actually going through two diodes, it can be turned on by either input one or two. So through the diodes and then to pin 11. So let's put the positive on pin two, which is here. And we'll go to pin 11, which is here. 
and we're not getting anything. Okay. Now, another thing we could do is test these diodes. Say, for instance, I'll just choose one at random. Say this diode here is connected between 12 and 15. So if I go positive on 12, this diode should show as approximately 0.6 volts drop. So let's find a pin 12 for the positive and it's going to pin 15, which is right next to it. And I'm getting my 0.6 volts of the diode. So you can check all the diodes in that way, but it appears that this relay here is faulty. And another way we could test this is if we brought it into the lab, we could get the bench power supply, set it to the, I think it's 12 volt system. Um, we could say, put the positive on the uh, pin two and the negative on pin 11. And theoretically, if that was working, then the relay should click. So positive on pin two, um, the negative on pin 11, and I'm not getting a click and I'm not seeing any current at all. Let's compare that. Let's choose this relay over here, 18 to 19, which is over at this end. Uh, it helps if you turn the thing on. Oops. So I can hear that clicking. Can you hear it? Uh, so the relay is clicking. Let's try that again on the other one, uh, which is the two was positive and the uh, I was going to pin 11 for the other connection. So nothing at all, not not anything. And I don't think it's these diodes. Um, I think it is the coil itself. Could be the diodes. I mean, a way to test that would be to, you know, why do they have two diodes? And then this extra diode, because they're not going to get feedback through that other diode. That's odd. That diode seems al almost superfluous. That's odd. I just noticed that this moment. But anyway, we've diagnosed that either uh, these diodes have failed uh, open circuit and uh, or this coil has gone open circuit. I'm guessing the coil has gone open circuit. And there's a possibility that if the bike had a, a voltage uh, problem, the voltage shot up, it might have actually burnt that coil out. So let's take a look at the unit and see if we can open it and if it's accessible. So four screws hold it on. Now this is quite an expensive module to replace. It's about $100, I think. So if it could, you know, uh, particularly if you get stuck in the middle of nowhere and you wanted to do a quick fix and you had basic electronic stuff or whatever, it would be nice knowing that you could actually fix it if you're not going to be able to get a replacement uh, in short measure. Or if you found that it was going to cost something like a pound to fix it, as opposed to a hundred dollars to actually, or a hundred, a hundred pounds. I have to say that in the UK, everything that we buy, the, the price in dollars in America is the price we pay in pounds. It's just, we pay a lot more for it. Not so much these days, thanks to the fact that they're, they're roughly equalish. So this cover comes off and it looks as though the, Term, the connectors in here look as though they're soldered directly to the board, which is a bit annoying. Let's take this screw out and try and prise it up and see if it comes out. Hmm, it's not clipped in. I think it may actually be being held in by these, so I'm going to have to desolder these. Now, I wonder how well they're going to desolder. Let's use a desoldering pump. And we'll start by wetting all those connections. Now this is going to take a modest length of time, so I'll undo, I'll desolder a few of them, and then I'll uh, pause the video while I desolder the rest. I'm just uh, once again, I've I've not cleared off my bench here, which means that there's lots of stuff on the solder iron cable. I wonder why there's a red dot in that. I wonder if it's just a mark to show it's been tested. So the first thing I'm going to do is flow fresh solder on because things always desolder a lot easier if you flow fresh solder on. Um, particularly if it's the horrible lead freeze solder, which is uh, quite crusty. I keep saying this. That's fine because uh, I've got no problem repeatedly saying that I dislike lead freeze solder. Uh, I'll also say once again that it's not toxic. Uh, lead based solder. 
So let's get the bulk of the solder off with the desoldering pump. This is where it would be quite handy to use the vacuum desoldering tool. But uh, having said that, I'd like this to represent what you could do with just basic tools. So we'll get the bulk of it off with the pump and then use a suitable desoldering wick and a bit of uh, flux would be quite handy as well. The flux would help it come off. Uh, this is where I try and find the flux pen and I suddenly realise that it's buried deep, very deep in my box of tools. No, it's actually lying right next to the bench. That's handy. So I'm going to apply some flux onto the desoldering braid because it just works so much better with fresh, juicy flux on it. And at the risk of leaving a big skid mark in the bench, I'll just do it straight on the bench. Yes, I've left a slight skid mark, that's all right. It shows that the flux is coming out. Let's uh, raise this up to a wee bit closer to the camera and see how well this is going to desolder. They're quite big, the connectors are quite big joints, so it may take a little bit more effort to desolder it. And as I say, uh, I'm going to uh, just desolder the first few connections and then I'm going to pause. Or I might pause now because I've just completely stuck the desoldering braid onto that solder joint. This is one of these applications that because they're a fairly chunky connector, it might benefit from a heavier duty solder iron as opposed to the light duty electronic one. But, um, that's got that connector more or less desoldered. So now I'm going to just pause momentarily while I get the other ones off. Oh, that was not easy. I'd just like you to know that I cheated. I had to crack out the big toys in the end to get that off. So I'm just going to turn this off so we can have some peace and quiet. Oh, there we go. That's much better. So that's a, a vacuum assisted desoldering pump. Oh, the cable's not very long. I'll just that down there and rather tragically it's very hard to get out and rather tragically it's a double-sided board so I've lifted a track here that's not fun at all other than that these relays look fairly straightforward but getting it out is an absolute bitch it's really not intended for this is it it's very much not intended for repair that's a shame it's a shame they do things like that this really here looks slightly puffed up. I Is that the one that's actually failed? Yeah, let's uh, test that. Or is that another issue? So, let's see, what are the... Uh, let's uh, find where the connections are. Uh, this really, are those the coil connections? Or is that going to be a contact with... These might be the coil connections here. Ah, there's a diagon up there. I think that is the coil connection. Let's test that out and stick this across and see if that one clicks. It may not be faulty. No, I reckon that is faulty. Yeah, it looks like that one's the faulty one that has burnt out. You can actually see the swelling in the case. So, it's an NEC Philippines... EQ1-1111S 7J5342 I'm not sure how straightforward we get I don't know if that's a standard format I presume you could find them I mean there aren't that many relay formats These little dinky ones look very like the, much like the Songo relays But I wonder why that one in particular has burnt out Actually you know what, let's open it and find out so it's definitely this has burnt out. You can see it's discoloured. So it's uh, probably been subjected either to a long-term operation. Maybe it's just maybe it's just been left running for a while, or the um, the voltage has risen to the point it's damaged it. And this thing is just not easy to service at all. The biggest problem is that it's a double-sided board. Double-sided boards are always just you know they're they're just that wee bit harder to fix. But when you've got big pins like this that are sinking heat away to these uh, terminals, then it makes it even harder. Uh, and that's why ultimately, even using the correct uh, suction tool, the sort of professional bench one, uh, I still 
struggled uh, and actually ripped a track off here. But there is another way around this. You see, even if the relay has if a relay has failed and it's gone open circuit, you can still potentially um, do some fixes in this if you're stuck in an emergency situation. You could get something like a relay. This one's a on a circuit board already, but if you got a standard 12 volt relay with, um, I think most of these are just a single contact, maybe some are, hold on, where's the drawing again? They're all just single contacts. Uh, if you got a standard relay, you could, and because they're by default open when the thing isn't energized, uh, that means that if the coil burns out, then you can effectively just put a relay across it, another relay. So you could open this up. If you're in, stuck in emergency, you could get some double-sided tape or something. You could stick a relay onto this and you could patch on with wires, a 12-volt relay that's capable of a decent current to the actual contacts in this. So, um, yeah, not an ideal result. Um, obviously, if you're doing that, you'd have to trace if the connections out. It'd be help, helpful, handy, having a schematic like this to trace on from the pins onto the circuit board to double-check things. But, you know, you could effect a repair uh, you wouldn't be able to get this lid back on again. You'd have to improvise something. And, you know, it's more of a sort of get out of an emergency situation type thing like that. But yeah, you could uh, rough up a relay onto that to fix it. But um, sadly, this thing is just not designed for repair at all. And that's a shame. You know, I don't like when they do stuff like that. Ultimately for them, all they're looking for is uh, the financial revenue from, you know, selling lots of spares. But there you go. Um... I'm sure Adrian will be pleased to know that ultimately it was faulty and it wasn't really easy to repair, so, you know, his money was justified in getting the new one. But, yeah, interesting, but kind of disappointing that, you know, I, I don't like stuff that's hard to repair. I prefer stuff that is designed with serviceability in mind, but interesting to see inside anyway, particularly given that it is just basically relays and diodes, very skimpy little relays. They've really cheaped out there a bit, haven't they? But, yeah, interesting enough.